Steve, why does nobody want to read our shit? When you were young, you learned a hard lesson. Nobody wants to read your shit or, or, or buy your product or sign up for your program. Why is that? Um, well, this book of mine, No One Wants to Read Your Shit, really comes from, uh, originally from my experience working in advertising. And one of the things, the first thing you learn when you work in advertising is that nobody wants to read anything that you put out. You're an ad, your commercial, they're waiting with the remote to click right through your commercial. They're waiting to turn the page of any ad. They hate everything you're going to, and I hate it too. You know, they don't want to read it. So that to me, for anybody in any creative business, for any writer, any anyone at all, filmmaker, whatever, that's sort of the ground level awareness that you have to have, that your go people are not out there waiting to hear your wonderful stuff, you know? Like, I, as I said to you when we were talking earlier, I can't even get my mother to read my books, you know? I mean, I have to pay her and she doesn't even want, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> But seriously, nobody wants to read it. So the bottom or, line, or read your Facebook post, or or like you said in the book, you know, uh, uh, visit your new sesame seed, sesame chicken yeah. joint, or or whatever it is you're creating. Yeah, and so the lesson of that is that you, the writer, you, the creative person, have got to make whatever you're offering so compelling and so good that people would be crazy not to pay attention to it. And you know, I think sometimes. We're in, when we're in school, we're in class and we turn in a paper, our professor has to read it, you know? So we think, oh yeah, anything we write, anything we put out there, people are going to read. Not true. So it creates a real humility and a positive empowerment in your mind to realize that nobody does want to read it. So you better make it great. Yeah. And so many people you know, the listeners included want to, maybe they want to start a side hustle or they have a thing and, and they think it's a great idea. And like, everybody's going to sign up or, or read it. You know, I'm going to start a blog. I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to start this business and everybody's going to sign. Up. I'm going to open a restaurant. Everybody, everybody's going to come flooding in because it's such a great idea, but there are a lot of great ideas out there. Yeah, Everybody's busy and their attention's being pulled. So it is, it, it is relieving to hear that like, okay, just because I hit publish on my first blog post and you know, the internet didn't come flooding to, to read it. It's okay. That's normal. That's part of the process, right? Definitely. I mean, if you're starting, you know, a blog or a podcast, Jim, as you know, it's a, a little by little word of mouth thing to build over time. Um, it's just the reality of things of, of the world. You know, nobody does want to read your shit. <laughs> yeah, I remember, Steve, when you, we talked uh, offline in a conversation in between our last two podcast episodes and you told me about that book. I'm like, and I, I'd seen it before. I'd you know, seen it on your list of books <laughs> that you'd written. I'm like, and you're like, Jim, before you write your book, you've got to read this. And man, it was, it was such a great book. It was such a, uh, an eye opener for me. And it's relevant for everything, whether you're for the listener, whether you're a writer or a teacher or a parent or a coach, or you're thinking of some business that's not writing, it is 100% relevant to you. So I, I highly recommend it. Uh. And Steve, uh, you know, you, when you published your first novel, when you finally published your first novel, you said it was easy. You said this, and this is straight from your book. You said, and I'm going to read a bunch of bullet points here for the listener. He said, uh, uh, because you had learned how to start a project, how to keep going through the horrible middle, how to finish, how to handle rejection, how to handle success, how to receive editorial notes, how to fail and keep going, how to fail again and keep going, how to self-motivate, validate, and reinforce, how to believe in yourself when nobody else on the planet shares in that belief. So my question for you, Steve, how does one learn all of that and become the overnight success that you did? Well, <laughs> and say that tongue -in -cheek. About the story of the part you're leaving out, Jim, is that it took me 30 years to publish my first novel. And for 30 years, I was failing and trying and failing again, and sometimes succeeding in partial ways. But uh, so when I say that I, I learned all of those things, I really had, but I learned it through 30 years of epic failures and, and, you know, having to go back to ground zero again and again and again. Were there books? I'm, I'm sure you, you, you know, you read the books along the way, there were lessons along the way, but there are certain things you can just only learn by doing right. In, in my background, the sport of wrestling, you can read all the books, you can watch all the film, but unless you're, you're doing it and living it, 
and, and, you know, getting the blood on your face and, and the sweat and, and experiencing the, the mistakes, like you, you just have to do it and you have to fail. Right. Absolutely. And I, I, I think it's, you know, like you're talking about wrestling, Jim, like I swear that there's a component in our, in our bodies that change, you know, in our DNA that change when we have these catastrophic failures and we fall on our face completely where we don't know where, where to turn something changes in our DNA or, or so I don't know what it is, but I, I think we, we actually evolve physically. You know, one of my favorite writers is Lawrence of Anderpost. I don't know if have you ever heard of him. He's a I've South African writer, wonderful writer. He died a few years ago at like age 90 or something like that. And one of his uh, theories was that nothing we accept through a fever. And he sort of, he believed that, the body, the brain, the temperature of the brain had to go up somehow to sort of, you know, implant some some change in it. And I've sort of watched that from time to time in myself. And I find that I do have moments where, you know, in the middle of some big change, I'll get sick and I'll I'll take to, I'll be in bed for three days. And I, I sort of cheer myself up by saying this must be the change happening. You know, this is something going on. So I do think, like you say, you've got to really fail on the on the physical level as well as just reading about something like that. Yeah, there's a there's a real physical response to failure, and there's a real physical response to learning. I remember I, I got my master's degree in teaching, and I remember one of our professors telling me that that there's an actual physical change in your brain when you learn something, an actual physical change that, that can't be undone whenever you learn something. And, and then there's the other part of, of learning that, you know, I more, mostly learned this through, through sports, through wrestling, is that you learn most through failure. Like you don't learn through winning. Like if something just comes to you easily, or if you're, you're competing against, you know, lesser competition, you, you just don't, you know, you don't learn. It feels good. It feels great. You know, we all like to learn. We all like to be good at what we do. The listener, you like to be good at your job. You like everything to be smooth. You want to show up and win every day at work, make every sale. You're not going to become that next level of you without the failure. So the, the failure and then the, the learning that comes from failure makes that physical change. And that was, that was part of the process that, I mean, that you certainly just talked about in terms of the physically getting ill but also this, this decades long process that got you from, you know, oil field worker, taxi cab driver, struggling to one of the most recognized writers in the United States and the world. Well, you know, the other thing about it, Jim, as you well know, is when this, when this physical failure comes, there's a tremendous amount of pain with it. Not just, not just physical pain, but, you know, emotional, psychological pain, which seems to, which is a lot of the, re the reason why people don't want to kind of undergo passages like this and don't want to don't want to pay the price and why those who do pay it have to be driven by some, you know, crazed aspiration or something. I certainly feel like I was, but you do want to avoid those horrible, painful moments. But those are the moments that you grow. You know, sometimes, you know, like watching, say, something like the World Series for me or the Super Bowl just recently, and you look at the winners are out there on the field and the confetti is falling and they're doing their snowman on the field. And then they, you know, they cut to the, to the losers, right? And sometimes it's a, just a solitary guy sitting on a bench with his towel and you know, his face down, or people will be in tears in the dugout, the losing team of the, and a lot of times I think to myself, I, I envy those guys because you can see that they are changing in that moment. And you can tell that they're, and a lot of times a coach will say to a team that lost, say the World Series last year, remember what that felt like, you know, burn that into your brain because you don't want to ever feel that again. And so next year, when we come back, we're going to give that little more that we didn't think we had to give this time. So I do think that you know, you see a guy crying in the dugout, a losing team in the World Series, and the guy's, you know, is obviously in agony, but you can see he's changing in that moment, you know? And a lot of times, you know, remember, Nick, do you know Nick Faldo, the golfer? Yeah. Who has won, I don't know what, six or seven majors or something. When he came out, they used to call him Nick Foldo 
because he would, you know, crack under pressure. And he he took that and sort of rebuilt his whole game, rebuilt his game physically, rebuilt it mentally. And uh, that was when he worked with David Ledbetter, the famous coach. And, you know, that pain, I'm sure if he talked about it, he would say that pain, that humiliation, that was really what made him a champion in the end. I think the greatest success through failure story ever that we've seen lived out in front of us is the basketball program at my alma mater, University of Virginia. They uh -huh. went from losing the first team in the history of the NCAA basketball tournament to lose the first number one seed to lose to a 16 seed. I mean, this is historic, absolutely uh -huh. historic loss. And then what do they do next year? The following year, they go and win the whole damn thing. Like, like what, like, how, how do you do that? How do you have this turn? Like, and, and it's not, you know, it sounds like a fairy tale story looking back on it. Like, ah, oh, it was kind of meant to be, it was this destiny. It was this great story of failure to success. And, and no, it wasn't, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that they were going to turn that, that failure into success, but their head coach, Tony Bennett, often he repeated this many, many times. He said, and this was from a, a TEDx talk that he watched. He actually watched uh -huh. a TEDx talk on failure that really resonated with him. And it wasn't mine, which kind of <laughs> I got in front of him because I could have been my part of that story. But anyway, he, he watched this TEDx talk where this guy talked about how failure will buy you a ticket to a place that you could not have gotten to otherwise. And he said that after the national championship, he said that actually he said that before they won. But he, he embraced this. This was part of the process. Who did that TEDx talk, Jim? I don't uh, know, but I tell you what, for the listeners, I know everybody's your your you know interest is peaked in this. For the listeners, I'll put this in the uh, in the action plan. So you get, if you go to jimharshowjr.com slash action, I'll find that TEDx talk and put it in the link. And Steve, I'll send, I'll uh, email it to you. Did Tony Bennett ever write a book about that year, or did anybody ever talk about? Because I'd be fascinated to see what the actual change was week by week. Yeah. 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 He hasn't. Um, he's still coaching. They're the reigning as, as we record this, they are still the reigning national champions because the national tournament didn't take place uh -huh. last year. So first ever, uh, return, you know, two year reigning national champions that didn't have to defend it in the, the, the year following it. But, uh, but there's, there's interviews and there's uh, a lot yeah, of great, yeah. you know, stories about it out there. And it's just, uh, I, again, one of the greatest success through failure stories ever told. I'm working on getting Tony on this uh, podcast. Yeah, so for the listeners, uh, hang tight. We're working on it. We're going to get Tony on here and or some of the players that were part of, of that experience, the failure and the, the success the following year. And Steve, I want to give the listeners some hope because they're like sitting there. They're like, okay, Jim, I'm in the messy middle. I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with the, the failures and the setbacks and the struggles and all of this. And I don't really see light at the end of the tunnel. Can you give me something that I can carry with me to, 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 to make me strong, right? To, to help me carry this burden. And, you know, that's, that's when I want to transition into, uh, this, your book, the warrior ethos. Um, and, and by the way, for the, for the, if you're the listener, if you're not watching on YouTube, you can watch this on YouTube and you can see behind me a very cool Spartan mug made in the old spartan kothon style by joel chirico chirico pottery we'll have his link in the action plan as well and uh man what a cool mug this is what the spartans carried wow. around with them uh the spartan warriors and that came uh along with uh this book showed up as well and what a fantastic book the warrior ethos is is it is is this warrior ethos something that that we need to carry with us to to you know it's not just about i don't think and you tell me for warriors, for true warriors, right? Carrying the gun into battle, but it's for all of us. Right? Absolutely. In my opinion, anyway, it's really, I mean, to me, it's an inner game, you know, it's an interior game, whatever it is, whenever, we're, whenever we're struggling with some, we have some kind of aspiration that we're trying to enact on our own, right? To start a business of our own, to write a book, write a movie, write a, whatever, anything like that. The question becomes what, or basketball or wrestling or anything like that. What is the interior mindset? What, what do we have to get ourselves into to be able to over, to overcome whatever odds are, are we going to face? And I think, you know, a model to me is somebody like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or anything like that. And you look at them and, and, you know, the highest praise they can give to an athlete is he's a warrior, right? I'm sure that's the truth in, in wrestling. So it doesn't matter 
to me, it's not a specific like a gun in your hand. You're fighting a war. That that's not that's not the thing for me. It's the it's the struggles that we have to do between our ears. And to me, the, I'll rattle off a few warrior virtues. Um, and this comes from studying the Spartans and Alexander the Great and any you know military thing in any era. Obviously, the first one would be courage. But other ones that are sort of un, you know, unsung a little bit are patience. A warrior is always patient. You know, sometimes if you think about the uh, tribesmen in Afghanistan, they've been patient for like 5,000 years, right? When the Russians invade, the British, us, whatever, they just wait and wait and endure and endure and endure, and they win. Another great warrior uh, virtue is selflessness, right? It's always about the unit and not about the, the individual. Um, love for one's brothers, um, the willing embracing of adversity. That's another real warrior virtue that you don't run away from stuff that's hard, but you run towards stuff that's hard. And so I personally, just as a writer, over the years, I've tried to, I try to inculcate that. I try to teach myself that and reinforce that in my, in myself mentally. So when I, I've written a lot of stories that are about warriors, particularly ancient warriors. It's really kind of a metaphor to me for the internal fight, you know, the in, the mental toughness that it takes to do that. And I'm sure that when we talk about the University of Virginia, that whatever that year long transition was, I'm sure it was all between the ears, right? These guys did not get better physically. They weren't jumping higher. They weren't running faster, but they had somehow you know, when momentum went against them, when they normally, when they would have quit and caved in, right? This isn't our game. We're going to, you know, let's start to get ready for the next game. They would hang in and hang in and hang in. And that's, that's a warrior virtue. And it's all between the ears. So for the listener who's out there going, okay, I'm doing the, I'm doing the stuff, right? I'm waking up early, uh, I'm working hard, I'm doing the extra and you know, whatever that is. And for whatever that it is that they're trying to, to accomplish and they're going, okay, so you're telling me I've got to em embrace this warrior ethos. What do I do? Like, what do I do? Like, is it a button I press? Is it a, uh, do I click my heels three times? Like, are there specific things that you do, Steve, or that you've seen others do, whether it's in your research on the Spartan culture or, or stuff that you do specifically that, that you can do? Like, like maybe it's tactics, maybe it's action items. Or is, it, is it stopping and, and putting down the pen or, or pushing away the, the, the computer that you're typing on it and, and meditating on something? Is it journaling? I mean, what are the specific things? things that you can do to embrace this, to live out this warrior ethos? I mean, to me, it's just, it comes down to work. Like as a writer, for me, I'm going to have, let's say a block of time in the middle of the day or the beginning of the day of maybe three to four hours. That's as much as I can work. I'm exhausted at the end of that. And so I will try to structure my day in such a way that I build up to that you know, for me, you know, that I prepare myself, I rehearse myself for that. Like for me, one of the ways that I do that is I go to the gym early. And because that kind of uh, doing something you don't want to do, doing something that hurts, you know, doing something that pushes you is a great rehearsal for then what the work is going to be in the middle of the day. And then when that time comes for me, I block out all distractions. I turn everything off, right? The, the door is locked. There's no internet, you know, or, you know, no social media, nothing coming through. And I'll just try to work, work hard through that time. And then the end of the day for me, and this I think is a really important aspect that people overlook is what I call self-reinforcement, self or self-validation. It's like when we were, on a team, on an athletic team, or when we were in the army, or when we were working in a job or on a factory line or something, we had, we got reinforcement externally. We would get a bonus, we get a check, you know, our boss would say, you know, good work, whatever, right? Or we wouldn't be fired for that week, but we would get some kind of reinforcement and validation from outside, right? And it means a lot, like on an athletic team, that's a big part of the coach's job, right? And, and the assistant coaches, 
to keep motivating the, the person when they do good to, to reward them. But once we're on our own doing something, obviously, you know, you're, do, you're doing a podcast or whatever, there's nobody coming in at the end to pat you on the back. So I definitely have moments at the end of the day where I kind of review what I did and I give myself, you know, I give myself some props for that. You know, I self-validate, I self-reinforce. And then the next phase for that for me is preparing for the next day, you know, to to realize that this is a this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a way of life. It's the rest of my life. And to um, when I validate myself for this one day that I've done the best I can, then I'm, I'm trying to laying the groundwork for tomorrow, that I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to let whatever excuse comes up. I'm not going to let that get in the way. I'm going to say no to it right away. So I think it's it's a continual process for me, Jim, of, of self-education. I'm training myself. I'm my own coach. You know, I have to kick my own ass sometimes. And, and sometimes I have to praise myself. And I'll, I'll keep, I have one other thing. Can I keep talking here? I know I'm kind of, Please, this is fantastic. This is great. Another thing that's really important to me that I don't see people stress at all is I pay attention to my dreams. I'm definitely a believer that our unconscious is working to, on our behalf and trying to help us. And uh, there's a wonderful book called Inner Work by Robert Johnson, who is a, it's a little short book. Uh, Robert Johnson is a famous Jungian psych psychotherapist, and it's about analyzing dreams. And, uh, and he gives you kind of a technique for it. But a lot of times I will find, uh, you know, a dream will come to me that will it really encourage me. And I see this in other people's lives, too. I mean, I could name a couple of things. I won't go on forever on this, but where, where I've been ready to quit and I'll have a dream. And once I analyze the dream, I see that the dream is telling me, you know, be strong, hang in there. It's it's like a coach reinforcing me. So I'm a big believer in listening to, to dreams. Yeah, I've heard a lot of tactics and, and thoughts on this show over the years. And I, this might be the first time that I've heard that. I know Tim Ferriss has talked about dreams. Well, these are called lucid, lucid dreams. dreams where you actually enter about. the dream yeah. yourself, right? Yeah, yes. I've never been able, right. I've heard about that, you know, but I've never been able to do that. But I'll give you an example. This is in my book, The War of Art. Uh, I had a dream when I was really at a very bad place. It's not a long dream. I know dreams are boring, but but bear with me on this one. And uh, I was on an aircraft carrier. I was a crewman on an aircraft carrier, but the aircraft carrier was stuck on land. It wasn't in the ocean. And which was an absolute metaphor for how I felt in my life. And it was launching planes. It was doing its thing, but it was stuck on land. And there was one guy on the aircraft carrier, an old Marine gunnery sergeant, whose name in the dream was Largo. He was the guy who everybody sort of looked up to, who was, you know, kind of knew what was going on. And uh, I didn't know where this guy was in the dream. And I was standing next to the rail in the dream and the ship's captain came over to me. And he was as depressed by this whole thing as anybody else. And he said to me, what are we going to do about this, Largo? And I said, and I, you know, I woke up from that. And it was a dream that like hit you right between the eyes that said, you know, you're the leader of your own trip. You know, things are screwed up, but you're the one that that, that is in charge of that. So, uh, in fact, are we on video here, Jim? Yes. Yeah. One of the things in Robert Johnson's book. When you have a dream like that, he says, do something physical to commemorate it. So what I did, this is my little T-shirt here. You can see this. I went out and I got a little ID tag, you know, from the store. I put that on my, on my T-shirt. And uh, uh, that's like 20 years ago. So I love that. I love great things like thing. that. Specific tactics that you can do. And it's like, it, it's a consistent reminder. And for my clients who are out there listening, you know about the environment of excellence. And this is another part of that environment of excellence, like planting things like that, that are, that are reminders and, and performance psychologists talk about like, um, for example, like, like a, a hockey goalie, if a hockey goalie gives up a goal, they need a, 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 an emotional reset and they train them to have something they look at. Maybe it's a spot on their glove or on their Jersey or something like, or a spot on the rafter, whatever it is, like something that they look at that is a reset. And 
And that's what kind of like what this is. This is a reset for you. It's a constant reminder. It's something that that plants it, 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 it plants that seed. It reinforces that that thought of like, I you know the thought that you you got from the dream. I am the captain of this ship. I am in charge. And the other thing about that, Jim, I, mean, I can tell you what that when I had that dream, it was tremendously empowering to me. I mean, I didn't just forget about it. I thought, oh, this is. But the other thing is, if you think about what what the meaning of this is is that your unconscious is working for you all the time and is on your side. That's a whole great um, source of, of self-empowerment to think, I'm not just alone up here in my head driving myself crazy. There's a, a, a below the level of the iceberg, you know, the 90% that's below the level of the, of the ocean. The stuff that I'm not even aware of is actually working for me and trying to help me and trying to encourage me. And that makes you feel not quite so alone, you know? It's the biggest part that I think people miss. I think that is such the unharnessed power of the unconscious mind that that people overlook. And and you know, that's that's why they're you know, a lot of folks don't get the results that they want or they quit or um, they feel alone in, in, in yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up because that is, that's the stuff. I mean, we can sit here and talk all day about, you know, uh, you know, nobody wants to read your shit and, and, and you know, the, the techniques between behind, you know, getting people to want to read, but like, you've got to put the belief behind it. And when you combine those things and then the warrior ethos, then like, that's when the magic happens. That's when we can fully be ourselves and bring our best selves and our best work to the world. And just to say further on selling dreams. I, people sometimes will say, well, I don't dream, you know, I never have dreams, you know, which of course is completely crazy. We do have dreams. You dream all the time. I have beside my bed, you know, I keep this little tape recorder and I, I find that the more you listen to your dreams, the more you'll remember them, you know, and they, and they go so they evanesce, you know, they just, you forget them so fast. A lot of times you'll wake up and you'll think, oh, I'll remember that. That was so vivid. There's no way I'll forget that. And then you do forget it. Um, and a lot of times that dream is solid gold. If I had forgotten that Largo dream, I would be a much, my sort of emotional bank account would be a lot lower. And the other thing about, about like one of the things Robert Johnson in his book suggests is to write it down. You know, don't just sit in a chair and think, oh, I'll analyze it write it down and it, it, it can be quite a process. It can take half an hour, an hour to do, but that really lets it really sink into you. I, I did this for a spell. I was into the lucid dreaming, the Tim Ferriss thing, and I never quite had that lucid dream, but I did start recording my dreams and it was fascinating because you're right, you don't remember them you, and, you, and you do dream. And I'm, I am actually pretty cognizant of my dreams by more than most people. I wake up and I, I I intentionally lay there for a minute and go, what was I just dreaming about just a moment ago? What was I dreaming about? And I, I pull it up and I remember it. And you know, it isn't five minutes later that I'm like, what was I, you know, I remember it. Yeah. Then, I, then I forget it five minutes later. It's yeah. gone, but there's such power in, in recording those. And I did it for a while and I, I got such power out of it. And I think uh, this conversation is going to bring me back <laughs> starting to do that again. I mean, I think in a way, even the whole discipline of journaling is a little bit like dreaming because you sort of, uh, you get into a little bit of automatic writing, you know, you're just sort of letting it flow. You're not censoring anything. And that's another way of accessing the unconscious, of accessing this this underground river that we were, you and I were talking about before, that, that's uh, flowing inside us all the time and is giving us power and strength if only we'll pay attention to it. So Steve, you, you go through your career and, and you learn that nobody wants to read your shit. You, you learn, you know, you, the, about resistance with a capital R, which for the listener, you heard me talking about in the, in the intro and in the bio. And we talk about the, that more in episode 256. So you can go back and listen to that as well. And, you know, you lived the warrior ethos in your own way. And the latest product of that is your newest book, A Man at Arms. Tell us about that. Um, a Man at Arms that you have behind you is a, um, I have a, a recurring character. And this again kind of goes back to dreams and the unconscious and everything. I have a recurring character in my book, only one recurring character, nobody else recurs, who's been in three books of mine. His name is Telamon of Arcadia. He's a, from the ancient world. He's kind of like the Clint Eastwood of the year one. You know, he's like the one man killing machine of the a samurai type of character of the ancient world. And he's kind of the embodiment to me of the warrior archetype, the, the supreme kind of warrior. 
So in a way, he's an alter ego for me. He's a character that sort of appeared on the page, just like we're talking about dreams. In these other books, he just sort of appeared of his own free will. I didn't plan him or anything. And he's been a minor character in three other books. And I thought, I want to write a book just about him because I, I, I want to follow his odyssey. He's like a real thinking man's soldier, you know, a guy that has a really deep philosophy, a very dark philosophy, and, and that you could see is desperate to get beyond just simply the warrior frame of mind, you know, of kicking ass on the enemy and being strong and all that sort of stuff. So I, this, this book, A Man at Arms, it took me like 13 years to actually come up with this story. I've been trying, you know, I would write outline after outline and, and I just throw them away. They just weren't right. And anyway, finally, I came up with a story. I don't want to give anything away, um, but uh, that really gets into this particular solitary one man killing machine of the ancient world. And so this, this is his story around the time of Christ. And it gets into certain aspects of faith and stuff like that as well. It's an incredible book. I'm not the whole way through it yet, but if, uh, so far what I've read, it is, uh, it is incredible. And Well, when you get to the end, it won't disappoint you. Yeah, good, good. And, and for all the listeners, you're going to love the character. Telemann is just, uh, he's a badass. He's awesome. So um, I look forward to, to, to read the rest of it. And I know the listeners, uh, I, I highly recommend the book. So check it out. And by the way, let me just say one thing about the, your little your Kothan that you have in the background, your your Spartan mug. This is, uh, we're going to have, uh, this is, is going to be a prize that we're going to have a kind of a contest of these things. They retail for 145 bucks a piece. I don't know if I told you that, Jim. Yep. And they're really one of a kind works of art. And it's going to be part of a, a contest that's related to pre-ordering the book. Yeah. So for, for the listener, we'll have the links where you can order the book. Uh, where you can find it, you can find it in, in all your favorite bookstores and, and online, et cetera. But we'll have those links and I'll have a link to Steve's website where you can learn about any of the promotions or anything like that that's going on. These mugs are are really cool and there's a story behind them and it comes with the the mug itself actually becomes with uh, an explanation of the the Spartan Kothan and that sort of how it's, yeah. des- you know, why it's designed the way that there's a specific design to it. Actually, c- can you tell the listener a little bit about the specific design of the mug? The, you know, cause no one's ever seen one of these, but you told Joel, yeah. Hey, this is what we know. Can you create one? Well, there's a, a passage in Plutarch. I wish I could remember where I just remember reading it. And it said that this particular mug was famous in antiquity. It was a mug that the Spartans took when they went to war, when they, t- when they went on campaign and they had to drink out of streams and rivers and things where the water might not be so great. And there were sort of two aspects to this mug. One that it, it had a, uh, its interior was black so that if there were any kind of silt or mud in whatever you were drinking, you wouldn't see it. And the other thing was it had a concave lip so that it would kind of catch some of the impurities. And so Plutarch wrote about this mug, but there was never a photo of it or a, a description or anything like beyond that. So I got together with Joel Cherico, the potter, and we said, let's try to redo this thing, recreate this thing. So he did that just as, a, as an artist. And that's, that's the story behind the Kothan. So nobody's seen it in one of these in 2,000 years. Yep. And uh, now we have one. You've got, I've got one behind me. You've got one in your hand. <laughs> Great for your uh, morning coffee. Yeah. The, the listeners uh, will have again, that link in the, uh, in the action plan. So go to Jim com slash action. Check out Steve's book. Check out the, his, his latest book, a man at arms, a fantastic book. Check out any of his other books. He's written, you know, uh, um, the war of art. Nobody wants to read your shit books along, you know, turning pro, like all these, these, these personal and professional development books. And he's written some amazing novels. He's just uh, an incredible talent. And, and Steve, thank you so much for coming on again, sharing your story and sharing the story, uh, your personal story, but also the story about your latest work. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks for having me. And also to our listeners, don't forget Robert Johnson's book, Inner Work, about the uh, analyzing of dreams. It's a really, it's made a huge difference in my life. Inner Work by Robert Johnson. Yeah, I'm adding that to my reading list. And uh, for the listeners, we'll put that in the action plan so you don't even have to remember. Great. All, All right. right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me.